Okay, so brilliant, Joe. Thank, thanks again for, for joining us. And just maybe for, for those people that aren't overly familiar with you, um, would you mind just kind of giving us a, you know, a bit of an introduction or a bit of your backstory and, and where you came to where you are now? Yeah, sure. Thanks, Mike. Um, I suppose originally from Rack in County Limerick, and um, I moved down here to Trinity for college. And I suppose as a young fellow, I played football, hurling, soccer, and everything. Uh, but I suppose I had a fairly bad back accident when I, when I was 12, which ended up leading me to stepping back from other sports and ended up doing a bit of athletics and thankfully ended up getting into the college down here in Trinity. And um, from there, I suppose, I started studying you know, on the health and leisure program and then ended up with a master's in nutrition science as well. So I suppose where that led me to, I, I never lost the love for football and hurling and, and, and all the other sports as well. So to, to get the opportunity to start working with the teams and that was a, was a great opportunity. And um, I always thank, thank Pat Flanagan for that. He was the one that was always, you know, showed me the way along the way, like, you know. Yeah. Um, and I, I suppose my interest was always in, in performance, but because of my own, background with you know coming from the back injury and that uh you know player welfare and physical activity in general was always a the main driver so i think it influences my my philosophy on preparing teams and athletes a lot that we can't just look at the the outcome of the player on match day we have to look at that player 24 7 but also importantly when they do step back from the sport that they're still physically active as well mm. so i suppose a bit of a mixed bag um yeah. mike you know i've had the opportunity to work across obviously the ga i've done a good bit and but my athletics background i've been in there and i've worked professional golf and, you know with horse sport ireland as well and that side of things and um, particularly in the venting and um, a few other bits and bobs down the road as well yeah very good uh, and the athletics joe yeah um you're you're still competing at, at some level there are you yeah, old man athletics, I call it, you know, so I did that in triathlon and a bit of adventure racing. So um, to be honest, I, I'm not competing at any great level, but I, I do like to keep myself in shape. So I, I, yeah. I still pop up at the occasional triathlon and 10K road race and so on, and that adventure race. Um, I suppose only last year, two years ago now, you take out COVID, I stepped back from the GA. So I'm so involved with inter-county teams uh, there for a 10 to 15 year period, I... I, I would have called myself a recreational runner as opposed to anyone that was taken at the top level because you know yourself like involved in teams and that you just don't have time to yeah. compete at a at a, a decent level if you are in the back of the team and I, I suppose my between the master's degree and undergraduate degree I kind of spent both the physical preparation and the nutritional preparation of teams so it, yeah. it was time consuming uh, yeah. but yeah trying to get back into it now trying to you know I I ran the, the world's over 35 steeplechase so I'm saying no if I, if I can get back competing again for the over 45 category we'll be, we'll be doing all right like, yeah oh. yeah yeah but uh, yeah, yeah I, enjoy it. I enjoy it yeah good so so people will obviously know you Joe from the work you did yeah with with Davey and the lads in Clare when you won all Ireland in 2013 and then also obviously in in, in Limerick in, in 2018 so there's um and then you were involved with you know lots of other teams obviously you were involved with Kerry and, and different teams down the line and um like I'm conscious, Joe, in this that when we're talking here, uh, there's people from loads of different sports, you know, and and you've you, like you've mentioned equine and everything else. Like there's people here looking from basketball and rugby and soccer and, and individual sports and everything, uh, and it's some some great feedback from coaches actually asking different questions and things to ask people. So I'm, I'm delighted to have you on from that kind of maybe a physical context. The, the rest were really, you know, about that coaching side of things in terms of the game. And um, I just think now is a really interesting period through COVID that, that, that people can make those kind of uh, maybe physical improvements in some ways or physical maintenance, I suppose, in other ways. Uh, and I, I just read you were talking in an article recently about the difference between over-sciencing and, and, and under-coaching. Do you want to maybe just expand on that a little bit while we while we kick off? Yeah, I, I suppose, you know, the great thing in the current scenario is that an awful lot of sports people now have time on their hands. Mm. And I, often when you look at the professional player or athlete compared to the you know, it can still be an elite athlete, but at the amateur status, you know, mm. the, the one difference is time. And, and then the subcategory of that is time management. And I find professional players and athletes are excellent at managing their time. And when, when downtime is needed, they, they manage downtime as much as they manage training time. And, and that's very, very important. So I, I, I think there's one thing we have to be careful of at the moment, just because we have more time, that doesn't mean we should do actually necessarily way more work unless it fits into the bigger scheme of things and the bigger plan. Um, and I, I suppose I've been thinking like this for a good while now, and I suppose at the, the GPA conference there uh, back in 20, 
2019, 2020, uh, I think it was November, I, I spoke about that concept of over sciencing and it's something that I just spoke to with uh, Dr. Marco Cardinelli who works out in Qatar, the Spire um, high performance area as well. And, you know, we feel that sometimes we, when we have the science, we, we go down rabbit holes because we have. And now if you add time on top of that, we've even more time to do it. And, and that goes for coaches as well as it does players and athletes. Um, but a, a policy I've always lived by, the simple that works is better than complicated that doesn't. And sometimes I feel we, we can hide behind complexity. So if we have a really complicated flute and plan and, and some other team or some other athlete is doing it, and then we just try to replicate it without first stepping back and identifying the problems that are right in front of us with that player or that athlete and that team. Uh, and I suppose that's where I was going with that article. That I, I felt sometimes we're trying to replicate other teams rather than being problem solvers ourselves. Uh, and I suppose my role in MTU, Formed IT3 as a lecturer, is, is working with training coaches and, and PTs and stuff like that. And it's one of the first things I say, like, there's no point throwing a thousand solutions at a problem if you don't know what the problem is. And I, I, I feel... We, we, at times we can venture down that road too much, Mike, where we, we've all the fancy solutions and, you know, GPS works, heart rate works, heart rate variability works, blood lactate profiling, cortisol, but the, all these things work. But you have to understand the why and mm. the what, you know. Mm. Um, so that's the gist of where I was going with that. I, yeah. I feel sometimes if we can just stand back and identify, like, like if look at Gaelic football, for example, and you stand and see what is the problem on the field, mm. right? We've identified a clear problem. Let's come up with a clear solution. And what I find is when you go with that mindset, and, and I had a great relationship with Paul Kinnerk in, in Beauclair and Limerick, mm -hmm. and, and Paul being such a, a games-based uh, coach, that's effectively what we did. So he would look at it from a, a games-based uh, situation. Mm -hmm. I would look at it from a physical situation, and we'd, we'd meet in the middle. But the end result was the volume was less because it was more specific to a problem. Yeah. Yeah. Before we move off that, give me that, that, that line again, Joe. The simple that works. Simple that works is better than complicated that doesn't. The simple that works is better than the complicated that doesn't. Yeah, we, I actually we, have it. I know you can't see it. I have it on the bottom of my computer here. It's the first thing I see every day. Yeah. And, you know, whether, like, I've been lucky enough to work in the Rio Olympics and I'm working now in the Tokyo Olympics. And sometimes people think it's really, really complicated. It's really hard at that level. It's not, to be honest as long as you have that mantra in my head mm. and you know one thing and i'm going slightly down a rabbit hole but i i see a lot of teams and across lo loads of different sports and you know i i, I love the opportunity to work with lots of different sports mm. and there are multidisciplinary teams and there are interdisciplinary teams and, and what i mean by that is the best interdisciplinary teams of all the professionals around the table with that mantra of saying right what can we do together that will maximize the performance, the health, the well-being of that player, that athlete, that team, as opposed to everyone trying to take a bit from that player, which is, from my opinion, a multidisciplinary team. So everyone wants a bit of that player. Mm. And that can be so taxing. And, you know, in that conference, mm. I spoke about the cognitive load in the player. Uh, and I made reference to a paper that was published over in, in England on soccer players that, do you know, the, the sports scientists wanted time, the strength conditioning, the nutritionist, mm. the psychologist, the coach, the tactical coach, the agent. Everyone wanted a piece of the player almost for their their perspective mm. whereas I think an interdisciplinary team should always put the player at the center and for it, when you have that context you can clearly compromise then so I I know for example when I was talking about working with Paul there like I had to compromise on some physical attributes but the most important things we got done he had to compromise on some of the tactic technical and tactical things because we were trying to be as efficient as possible so that the players were fit and fresh playing yeah. the uh, applying the technical and the tactical attributes to the best of their ability and yeah. sometimes we, we, we tend to do too much when we don't. And in this current climate, because we have time, mm. we feel we should be doing everything. Mm. I think at times we should just take a step back and reflect. That, 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 that last idea is interesting as well. There, It's like all those guys have to justify their existence a little bit when they're involved with, you know, at, at, at whatever level it is that they're involved with. You know, that's, uh, that's yeah. definitely interesting. And then, and then the loser is probably the player because they're getting pulled here and there and everywhere, you know. Um, maybe even to bring it down a level, Joe, to the, to the, you know, obviously there's lots of people that are involved in, in the juvenile game now that are, at, you know, during COVID or are, are at a space of just like, what should we be doing with kids from let them just play and, and let them get through this period to, okay, we need to give them a little bit of focus as well now to give them something to be doing. Where, where are you kind of on, on that kind of side of things now with, with whatever sport it might be with those younger kids? Yeah, look, I think the fundamentals are always essential. And the, the number one thing is fun. 
you know, and I know this is said so often, like, isn't it? Like, you know, we have to have fun, I have to have fun. Like, I, I saw a coach recently saying, I have to have fun, and he had all the drills laid out. And I goes, that looks ridiculous. <laughs> that looks misery. That's yeah. not fun. And yeah. he goes, oh, yeah, but like, we'll have crack with it. And I'm kind of going, no. So, look, we, I think, you know, if you think back to that age group, and, you know, I was only looking at things recently about, it was actually Johnny Giles was on radio being interviewed, and he was talking about the square he grew up in in Dublin. And they had four corners where they used to play in the square. And depending on whether the ball hit the window or not, they'd, ha- they'd have to move to another corner. But he, he and they had a, a ball that wasn't an official ball. It was, a, it was too bouncy. It was one of those light bouncy balls. And the, the, touch, the touch was brilliant by all the kids. And a lot of the, the lads that he grew up in, in that square um, ended up being semi-pro or pro players. And he puts an awful lot of it down to the unconditioned games that they have to improve their touch and so on so at that age profile when there was no clear competitions coming in or get back to competitions from yeah. that age profile, like, I, I think we should be looking at it innovative and creative games um, that will still develop all the fundamental skills um, when I used to be a regional development officer for Athletics Ireland and one of the programs I worked a lot on was the you know the, the introduction to athletics, athletics and it was the yeah. ABC agility mm. balance coordination and unfortunately, a lot of our kids now at the moment, uh, and I, I have two young kids myself, and we do have a PlayStation at the house, but I find our kids are actually getting less and less inactive. Um, mm. And I, I think, you know, sports can be an opportunity to reintroduce all those fundamentals of agility, balance, coordination, hand-eye coordination, eye-foot coordination. And, and it doesn't have to be very, very structured. It can still be purposeful. Mm. But sometimes we, we, we align structure with purpose unstructured can be purposeful in that it can be fun and hit a few of the key change of direction or you know, acceleration or movement characteristics as well. Mm, yeah. so a, a bit of a long-winded answer point for you, but I, I definitely believe we should look at more of a fun games-based um, initiative for, for that age profile mm. and not be afraid for them to do other activities as yeah. well when we don't have a clear competition date. Like what yeah. exactly are we training for at the moment? Um, you know, when, when will we play games? And there is no clear definition on that. So why should we be putting this cognitive load on, on senior players and kids, mm. you know, so that they end up by the time they start, that they're like, I've been at this for months mm. and I still don't know. And like that echoes back into the club game. I often feel, you know, club players not being able to go away on holidays with their girlfriend because there could be a game if the county team doesn't do well. There could mm. be. Don't go anywhere. Yeah, and I think I can respect the kids as well. Um. And just something I've always felt strongly about is I feel particularly and from my athletics background and having worked in athletics, I always felt that we had too much competition too young. And, you know, and are, I, are, I you ta- are you talking about the GA and spe- specifically or across the board? No, I was talking about athletics particularly okay. in, in, in that All one. Right, okay. I'm, I'm back a bit now. It's, it's got much better, to be honest. But I, I, I feel, I, I think it echoes back to my own experience that like that back accident I had, Mike, I, I had a 20% chance of walking again. So within right. two years, I had to learn what to walk and I, I was back running again. But my attitude is sometimes sport, although it's fantastic and, you know, you've competed at the highest level in, in both football and basketball, you know, it's so inclusive and it can be so great. But I often wonder how many kids are excluded from lifelong physical activity because of a negative experience in a sports context. We all mm-hmm. can't be good at sports. So I would be very conscious of making sure that we always have that in the back of our mind, that physical activity, in my opinion, is more important for, for, than sport for mm-hmm. overall health. Mm-hmm. But obviously, if you're good at sport, it's so rewarding. It's brilliant. Yeah. You know. yeah, so, but yeah. That, yeah. And we, uh, do you know what? We, we've been speaking about that with different people in the last couple of weeks, Joe, and that idea of kids playing loads of different sports when they were younger uh, and just, uh, you know, th- that kind of idea of giving them a, a sustainable lifelong, you know, love of, of physical activity and, and sport and health, any health promoting activity. Like it's funny. I know the kids aren't really supposed to be mixing or whatever, but I've got uh, two of my lads just go down there and there's three or four of them below and in, in uh, just a minute from the house and there's a big green area and, I was just looking out of them the other day up over the thing and like the kids organized a game of American football themselves, you know, and they're like, I, they don't watch American football. They don't know anything about American football, but suddenly they're throwing the ball and there's kind of half tackles and there's different things. And, you know, it's just, it's great. And it's that idea of completely unstructured play where kids are picking up all those basic fundamental movement skills that you're talking about 
in a way that doesn't involve putting down 75 cones and blowing whistles and, and whatever. And at this time, I know it's difficult because kids aren't really supposed to be playing with each other, but it's just, uh, it's it's probably as good as anything like that Johnny Giles example that you, you mentioned, I suppose. Yeah. One thing I often ask the first year physiology students that come into me, and it's, there's no science to this, and it's absolutely bonkers. And it's probably because I grew up on a farm above the West Limerick and there wasn't much more to do anyway. But I always ask the first years, how many of them have actually built a treehouse? Not a good one now, just literally grabbed a few bits of wood, grabbed a few nails and actually went messing in the trees and climbed trees. And, you know, you could have 100 students in there, 18, 19, 20 years old, and they're looking at you if you have you two heads. Like. But, like, I have a scar in the back of my head where my sister split me with a with a stick we were playing Cowboys <laughs> and Indians. And some of the, the... But did we develop a change of direction? Did we develop reaction, hand-eye coordination? Like, how many kids can skip nowadays? You know, or how many kids can actually box in a rhythm like we, we, you know stuff that and just like you give the exam there the kids playing american football you know sometimes we over coach and that's not just for kids that's for adults as well yeah. uh, at the elite level uh, like i remember we're in a training camp in portugal one time and you know the, the, the team will remain nameless but i'm sure if there's any of the players listening they'll, they'll remember it but uh, we were worn out from just hurling 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 and we said you know what there was under um, a rugby league team staying in the hotel at the camp and said why don't we just grab a few of the rugby balls off the lads and instead of doing a full-on session just have a bit of crack there for an hour and a half now heart rate monitors on every players this is the OCD side of me like I my, my monitoring strategy was always subtle like I say just stick it on it probably means not just stick it on and you know you take away the ownership then the yeah. ownership doesn't even care about it <laughs> but I'm looking at the data and I'm looking at the basically the anaerobic stimulus and the anaerobic load or the anaerobic load the aerobic load of that tag rugby game and I'm kind of going yes it's not exactly the way I want it but if we look at the biopsychosocial model of health, where there's balance between the biology, the psychology, the sociology, all the players are having great crack. They're talking about it since that we've got most of the physical objectives. They're not perfect. Yeah. But the following training session, the following day, there was a release. And my God, was it so focused? Was it brilliant? And, you know, sometimes we, we have to step outside the box and relax. Mm. That's a little bit easier. Yeah. And you mentioned, and, and that's a part of it, you mentioned fun earlier. And and like, if you ever ask coaches, like at any juvenile kind of thing, you know, at any sport, what's the most important thing here? They'll all tell you it's probably fun, you know? Um, and like, it's very interesting. I came across this bit of research by, by a lady um, over in the States, Amanda Visick. She did this uh, fun map uh, where she had 80, she found 81 determinants of fun that, that, kids and youths actually identified and, and named and articulated that they that they they basically came up with 81 things that kids are saying we find this really fun about about sports and like i i was speaking at a thing recently and i was saying like this is something every coach in every sport should have on their desk like you you like you mentioned about that saying at the bottom of your computer and say i need to be ticking as many of these boxes as i can and and whether we're we're you know obviously everybody wants to win and that's that's a something that's there but if i'm ticking the most of these boxes these kids are going to keep playing sports they're going to keep being involved here because this is something that's really really enjoyable to them and and it's yeah. like then when we get to an adult level it's like oh geez no it's not sports to be fun anymore that was fine when you were a kid but now that we're an adult this is serious shit no lads whether it's the club or whatever forget about fun and and i find that concept just just bonkers like we we still have to have it fun for for whatever adult sport you're playing you know yeah uh look it's I, I've been really, really lucky that like I, I've often felt like a fraudster amongst the, the, the backroom teams I've been involved with. I've like, worked with some of the best, best coaches and some of the best sports psychologists. And I can I can only speak from my experience, um, you know, particularly in, in hurling. And the one thing that we've always tried to do is you, you're working with young adults. You're working like, like I have 19 years of age coming in as a young adult. Yeah, he might be six foot five, <laughs> whatever. Yeah. And that is so, so important. And it's always been part of that. And, you know, even in the gym sessions, I used to try, we'd, we'd have the crack. Um, like in Limerick, like Fit 100 have been so good to us uh, in Limerick GA, like they let us use their facilities for, for so long. But we used to love it, the fact that it was in an open gym. Like we, we, we stuck to our own, but we had the crack. And you know, some people were looking going, all the messing and joking are those guys anyway half serious. We're still hitting all the numbers you need to hit, but you'd have the fun as well. And, uh, yeah, it's so, so important. And like in a snippet, if we take GA for, and it's my opinion again, so there's no science behind this. The GA career of an intercounty player it is so sharp in the bigger scheme of things, you know? And sometimes we feel because it's sharp, relatively speaking, we have to be OTT on it. But, you know, there, there's so many relationships that are developed and, and, and taken forward for all the rest of your life and so on. 
And a lot of those relationships are made during those fun times, those team building things. And, you know, team building is always happening. Like, you know, mm. sometimes we do team building like day, but it's always happening. But my point is, is when, when your shoulder is to a wheel and your Buffalo Crow Park is 83,000 people and, and you're down by X amount of points, you will bond to people you have relationships. I'm a firm believer in that. And those relationships and the tightest teams I've been involved in, it, the, that relationship, that bond, that trust, that communication comes from fun. Yeah. at the end of it now that doesn't turn around we go all on professional and go around like clowns but yeah. it is it, it, it is strategic it is purposeful uh but it still has to be authentic and natural at the same time yeah and like i i've always referred to you mentioned portugal there like so we we had loads of trips to portugal with, with Kerry and different things and browns and these different places uh over there but like it was it was never it was always like the last kind of night out which was crazy or after killing yourself there for four or five days or whatever it is training three times a day and then the last day fellas get for a few points or whatever but like the, the fun and the crack and the stories that came out of that would keep you going for six months and and you know and, and that's a huge part of it now obviously if you've got an under under 11 team you're you're probably not going to portugal to have a bit of crack but um yeah. joe in terms of the in terms of the uh the, the specifically the kind of snc side of it from when you started in that game, has there, well, there has obviously, but, you know, how, how big of a transition has it been from the type of training that was being done maybe when you got involved in GA circle first to, to where it is now? Um, I, I suppose it all goes in cycles and, and there's very little new stuff out there, to be honest, Mike. You know, there, there might be new technology, but the fundamentals have stayed consistent and mm-hmm. they've, they've come around in cycles like like heart rate monitoring is, is very, very popular now again. Um, but I remember when I was down in Waterford, the Waterford hurlers in 20, 2009, 2000, 2010, sorry, like we, we were doing it then and we were looking at the internal load of players and then it went out of faith with GPS and now it's coming back in again. Um, you know, so these things have never gone away. They've always been there. They're always evolving and so on. But I, I, I suppose where the, the major shift has been and it, I, I think it, it's particularly in the GA for strength and conditioning the GA it's the, the variety between the roles of strength and conditioning coaches for, between different counties varies so you see sometimes you'd hear strength and conditioning coaches very much front front and centre could be almost a selector on the team or very mm-hmm. much involved and then other times they're not allowed into a meeting room you know they're they're seen as a very you know it's, and it's it's Matt that that varies amazes me because my belief is and of course I'm biased towards this, but the one person that probably has the most contact with your players, the most touch points, is the certain clinician coach because they'll yeah. be at all the recovery sessions, they'll be at all the gym sessions, they'll be at all the field sessions, they'll be at all the team meetings. <laughs> you know, to, to not engage and tap into that person because they have the most touch points player, I think amazes me. But where I see uh, and this prompted me to do that talk for the GPA above in Crow Park, I, I do believe that times we've gone too far down filling time as strength conditioning coaches and doing stuff. And you said it earlier to justify our existence. Um, like I, I think the irony of it is we're over sciencing it. And in doing that, we're ignoring the basic scientific principles. Um, and one of the things in the context of the GA is we don't have time. Oh, yeah, yes, elite players, and I don't want to go down that debate of pro and non-pro, but like GA counter players are elite. They're playing at the highest level in their sport. They can't go any higher. They are elite. It's, mm. it's in the, But they're also working. So mm. the irony of this is I find it easier to work with professional players and athletes. Mm than I do with GA players because there's you had the time to have that. So where I'm going with this is that I feel that we're filling too many things into a short period of time that we have with GA players and we're trying to do too many things and we suffer from the magpie effect where we're always drawn to the newest tire, the newest thing, whereas we should be pairing it all back and really just looking at what the problems are, what can be done. And you know, another thing I say to the students always is that we have to look at the context and the compromise. So work hard at identifying the context because when you're very clear with your context, you know what you can compromise on then. And mm-hmm. sometimes you have to compromise on good stuff, but when you have a clear context, you'll only compromise on the good stuff because you keep the best stuff, mm-hmm. the thing that makes the most difference. So where this swing, I suppose, when I started out with club teams and that, say around 2004, 2005, like I, I'd done a spell with Crokes and Kerry and actually my first team and you'll know a few fellas the likes of Joe Costello and him who will shoot me to say like that same Pats and Blenderville were the making of me like you know <laughs> I always get that you know so uh, but um, you know where the shift has gone is that we're, we're we're becoming that multidisciplinary 
I believe. Whereas we have to go back to the interdisciplinary. Some of the best teams that I would have worked with is a small cohort of people that you, you have the manager, uh, you probably have two selectors, you probably have a hurling coach and you have the fitness coach. And, you know, mm. everyone else is very, very important. But what we're seeing now are multiples of all of these people. Mm. And, you know, like there's X amount of people doing this and X amount of people doing that. And I, I often relate it back to when a player, it, it's like when you, when you have your parents and you're in trouble as a teenager, and you, you have to size up your father or your mother to see right, which one of them is on my side. And I'll bounce the two of them off each other because at the end of it, they'll forget about me. And, and I've seen players at the past going, oh, no, that coach said this and this coach said that. And the players are stepping back and not doing that. And, and the coaches are at loggerheads. So um, that's a very long-winded, my apologies about that, Mike, but it, yeah. I, I think it is complicated because I do feel where we're, the shift is going is in multiple, multiple people. Whereas I think we need to go back to basics and have less people who have more responsibility and, and, and hold them responsible to it and, and hold people accountable to what they're supposed to be achieving and ask people to justify their decisions and make sure these people feed into the bigger scheme of things. And as you say, they're not just claiming time for themselves, that it feeds into the bigger picture as well. Mm. Yeah, and you, you mentioned the technology side of it there, Joe, and, and that's probably... That's pro- is that probably the biggest shift in, in, in the last kind of, you know, 15, 20 years when, when you know, the old kind of uh, Mick O'Dwyer trained Kerry teams, they're like the greatest training variety they had was probably running 20 laps one direction and then they'd change and run 20 laps the other direction. Whereas now everything, as you mentioned earlier there, like the data, the science, the, the loading, the high speed running, everything now is kind of uh, is a little bit more monitored than, than it was, I suppose. 100% and that is only useful if you can do something with it mm. you know mm. uh, and that was another point I was making in that article like you know that monitor your data and it, it, that is only useful if it's actionable mm-hmm. uh, don't be giving me stats and, and you know I, I've annoyed people in the past when I do the five year old test and I just say a five year old as you know yourself with your own kids they'll say why at least five times <laughs> why why so when people kind of go oh you know that there's I don't, I don't want to pick on any one type of technology or anything. Yeah. But, you know, I just say, why? What difference does that really make? Now, don't tell me it'll make a difference down the road or it makes a difference yeah. in a sanitized, perfect research paper that is nothing to do with elite sport or a high-level sport because there's just too many variables. So they take away all the variables to make the research valid. But what makes sport great are all those unpredictables and all those variables. So for me, yes, particularly GPS and, and heart rate monitoring offer us great opportunities. I've I've leaned on both of them very heavily uh, over my time as an intercounty uh, strength and conditioning coach. Um, but what I've done is I'm fully aware of the downsides of both GPS and heart rate monitoring, as well as fully aware of the benefits of those and, and try to look at the things that I can be actionable upon or what's very critical for me when it comes to data in relation to GPS in particular is what, what way can I use this data as a communication tool with the other coaches? So what, what numbers can we, can, can we take from that data and replicate that with the KPIs from the technical coach? So the technical coach is trying to look for X, Y, Z out of the drill. Uh, I can begin to look into that data and say, right, this, these data sets are relative to that. So for example, we used to look at high-speed running. And I, I was never really a huge fan of just doing high speed running for the sake of it. So like Mass Runs and, and Dan Baker and all these guys, it's fantastic research. And it's per- it really, really good stuff. Mm. But And it works. And in a professional sports setting, when you have 30 hours a week to work with your players, I'm okay with it all then. Mm. But when you're working with inter-county players, my opinion on this, and loads of inter-county teams use this, and it's just my opinion. And it's the reason why I justified, it goes back to that context and that compromise. I'm not saying it's not that good. It's, it, is, it is very good. But I have a very limited period of time with these players. Mm. And I can't cram it full of stuff just because the stuff is good. We have to use it. What's the optimal time? Um, so like things we'd have used was to look at the high-speed running and then look at the drills that have movement in them, certain types of shooting drills or passing drills or tactical plays where you're going to play a ball into a certain area. What are the movements in there? And can we integrate some element of a pre-run or a post-run just to get that high speed into that technical tactical drill. So my point is, is when you're using that GPS data or heart rate data, and like I, I put them, like I've used heart rate and GPS equally. Uh, like Claire in 2013 was 100% uh, heart rate, you know? Um, so it, it def- that's the internal load versus the external load. Mm-hmm, and you have to mm-hmm. decide which one you're going to use. But my main point here is that that data has to be actionable. Mm. And, you know, I, I've seen spreadsheets of data. And I'm yeah. like, on I like I don't have a 
PhD in mathematics. Like I, yeah, I have yeah. no idea what this means. Like, can I go to the manager and say, Mike Quirk, these are his numbers, all right? And beside me is the skills coach. This is his playing style. Like, how many times have you heard players being ambassador for the GPS numbers? And you're kind of going, his style of play, he's never going to run those numbers. Don't try to make him run those numbers. But his style of play, his size, his, his positioning, his reading of the game tells me so much that those numbers are secondary. Mm-hmm. There's, a, there's, there's one player that comes to mind, got an all-star recently that I would have worked with. And his numbers were always poor. And he'd be coming to me. And I, I, at the start, I was saying, look, they don't matter. Your job as a defender is bum, 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 bum. And that's nothing to do with me. Okay, my job is to make you big, strong, fast, explosive, and keep you injury free. Your job has to focus on the skill side, the technical side. Trust me, your man is there to score this nearly all season every game. Won't be mm. worrying about hitting mm. what a half back or a half forward is hitting. And yeah. um, so it has to serve function and it has to be actionable. And for that to happen, less is more. Mm. And therefore, you have to throw out some good stuff, but you have to make sure that you're keeping the best stuff. That's critical. Mm. That's that, and that's yeah. I I'm I'm a hundred percent with you on that stuff. I think the 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 influence of of data and numbers and and statistics, uh, while while they can be very useful if you if you know what you're looking for. If you're looking for a specific thing, like you're mentioning, if it's something that's actionable that I can take onto the field and say, guys, this is something now that we can that can help our game. If it can't. They're, they're really, you know, there's a huge amount of purpose in them, you know, but um, it's it's just, yeah, that's that's a very interesting, but but I suppose to take that a little bit further, Joe, in, in terms of this, the S&C stuff, there's probably a lot of people doing a lot of stuff uh, during their training session that isn't hugely relevant to benefiting them in whatever game that they're playing as well. Is that fair? Yeah, 100%. Uh, and it goes back to the why. Why are you, why are you doing it? You know? And, and, and you know, it's like a, there's a professional golfer I work with and one of the conversations is going, whatever we do, it has to lead to what the skills coach or the golf coach has, you know. Mm-hmm. All right. Does this lead to something there? Mm-hmm. You know? And, and sometimes that could be, like, it, for me, I'll give a practical example. Hamstring's number one injury in GA sports, you know? So we do need to have that posterior strength. So like I've spent months and months and months working on the gluteal strength, the hamstring strength and the range of motion and flexibility. That clearly serves a purpose for me because that's a strategy that help us prevent the most common recurring mm-hmm. injury. Um, and, you know, to always lead it back to that scenario. And, you know, at times we, we just do stuff because it's popular or because other people are doing it. And, and then what you're doing is you're ending up with these 90 minute, 100 minute, 120 minute sessions. And you're kind of, you're going like that. And a point I want to make, and I, I, I was expressed, I spoke at the at a conference for Horseport Ireland recently. And one of my main slides was a simple slide. Fatigue does not mean fitness. And making people tired is relatively easy, you know? Mm-hmm. And fitness is a, like there is the principles of training and there are the components of fitness. That's what fitness is. There's health-related components and performance-related components of fitness. So if you're making someone fitter, you have to make sure that you're ticking all those boxes and ticking the boxes that are most applicable to that performance. But sometimes uh, we just do stuff in sessions for the sake of doing it mm-hmm. uh, when you can't clearly identify a why. And that's why I double back to the relationships of an interpersonal team um, you know, you know, John Kiley for me is a fantastic manager, like, you know, one of the best that's out there. Uh, and the thing is, he will always, always challenge you, you know, and it's nothing personal. And it's a, it's a healthy relationship. And all he wants to know is, why are we doing this? And I don't know how many times I've been asked over the three or four years I was working with John. And the more he asked it, the more I appreciated it, because it really stops to make you think. Mm-hmm. Uh, and when we ask those questions and when you can justify what you're doing, um, you can reduce the overall volume of what you're doing. Mm-hmm. And then that's the time. That buys you time, which is such a valuable commodity in, in an amateur sport. Um, and then it's about managing that time as well, which is very, very important. For a lot of the time, like how many times have players complained about carrying niggles into sessions or into seasons, sorry. Uh, this is, and I, I wrote about those articles that say now is a perfect time. This is the time that GA players always wanted but never had yeah. the chance to get rid of all the little niggles and all that um and you know then i look at fellas pounding the road and i'm not anti-running like i'm a runner yeah. since i was 10 <laughs> you know? yeah. but you have to say what well, what's why you know mm-hmm. to get fitter but you know there's, there's so many different components of fitness 
what are the key attributes of a footballer or a hurler, a basketballer or a soccer player? Identify what you're trying to achieve. Yeah, I'd say a lot of those guys pounding the road is is nearly a a mental outlet as opposed to something they're 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 having to do for their fitness stuff. Uh, you mentioned you mentioned Paul Kinnerk earlier there, Joe, and and um, like the the idea this idea of games based you know coaching it, it's not a particularly new concept, but it's it's probably after you know taking a little bit more emphasis in the last couple of years in terms of marrying marrying the the fitness components that you speak about and, and maximizing the time that you have with players. Again, whether this is an under, I'm talking under 11s, 13s, 15s, intercounty, it, it's all generally the same in terms of the time and then the, the, what you want to try and get in with them. Uh, in terms of the game space, then Joe, yeah. Like, are we able to hit a lot of those physical markers that, that you would like by doing a games based kind of approach to, to our, our underage teams? Yes, most. Okay, mm-hmm. and we're beginning to tip into an area here that if, if you're just looking at this solely from a sports scientist perspective, uh, you're not going to get it all. Mm-hmm. That's where you have to have the confidence to say that you have the most important things in there. And, and that's where I feel some kind of the some of the conditioning modalities out there, they're so linear and so perfect that fit beautifully into a spreadsheet. And that goes back to having the, the fitness culture, the sports scientist or the strength culture, the athletic performance culture, all these fancy names people have, <laughs> you know, uh, Fitting, ticking the box on an Excel mm-hmm. sheet, you know. So mm-hmm. I've done, like, yeah, we, we weren't fitting again. We, we, we lost and we had a very poor season, made a load of injuries or whatever. It doesn't matter. I have my Excel sheet, it's fine, I'm covered, you know. Yeah. So that's where it's very, very important to have that relationship and that symbiotic relationship between the conditioning and, and the technical and tactical team of coaches. Um, and you, you have to realize that you are compromising a little bit. You know, like if I run out and say, right, I want to get 1200 meters high speed running. Okay, well, let's just run 100 meters 12 times and it's perfect. 1200 meters high speed running, job done. Okay. Yeah. Uh, they didn't change direction once. They didn't decelerate. An, an awful lot of injuries come from an inability mm-hmm. to decelerate. They haven't changed directions. They haven't had visual or spatial awareness to see where the balls are, see the passes, give the pass, hold the pass, take the tackle, give the tackle, run a decline. None of that's in that. Mm-hmm. It's just 1200 meters high speed running, but it yeah. fits the page. Mm-hmm. Um, so you are compromising a little bit. And when you have a good relationship, you can get most of what you want done on the field. So on-field conditioning, in my opinion, can be pretty much done with all the drills, as long as you're quantifying what you're doing and then slightly modifying. There has to be give and take on both sides. And then where you make up the balance is in the gym, uh, where you're getting the, the physical attributes that you're not getting on the pitch, that you're getting them done. So for me, like I, I think I stopped doing many years ago were ladders and hurdles on the pitch mm. because the fundamental principle of stiffness in the Achilles and the tendons and, and the soleus and the gastrox is that it's on a good surface and you've got that spring recoil reflex, okay? Mm. Uh, and, you know, in those th- those articles that we, we did for the GA and I'm sure that basically that was the main point I was making. So for me, we're doing that on a wet pitch in a pair of football boots and rushing it just to get it done just to justify my own existence. It, it never really made sense to me. Plus the groundskeepers give it up to you, you know? Uh, but so we, we would have a period of training and that is important, but we would actually integrate it into our, our, our gym work and our, because we had an astro in the gym, we, we would implement that right. in. Now, is, is that the best way of doing it? No, it's, I'd probably say it's the optimum mm-hmm. because it's, it's within the system. Um, as far as, you know, and, and sometimes people talk about change of directions and accelerations and decelerations. Um, I, 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 when you're looking at a small sided game, say a tactic drill, where it might be 30 seconds on off 90 seconds recovery, where we're looking at the, the glycolic energy system stimulus, that's the way my head is thinking in that. Uh, the skills coach is looking at tactical technique, evasion, and so on and so on. Mm-hmm. The GPS data within that five by five square isn't accurate enough, okay? Because the nature of GPS monitoring it doesn't know people will argue that there's accelerometers and dynamometers and all the variations in there but you know it's not perfect data so we don't look at that data um but what I'm looking at in there is the excessive forces that are going through the giants and the deceleration capability mm. and the change of direction and the loading so it doesn't make sense that if we're doing a heavy tackling drill or a, a small sided game that's in very confined confined quarters there's massive eccentric loading on the giants it doesn't make sense for me to do more eccentric loading or joint heavy work on top of that on the field session so we would plan this and periodize this so that you're you can strategically say right here's a window of opportunity for me to do that in my context but it's also been done in that context in the team with the the player or with the coaching staff Mm -hmm. so that's why like 
simple things. <laughs> you know, it's a very basic thing. You know that the, the technical coach and the head of fitness they, they share in the hotel rooms because it's yeah. the conversations you have, the little chats, and and reflection on what you've done. And don't just show up and do a drill. You know, show up and do a session. And a mm. session is holistic. And for me, the session starts two two hours out. Where you how you prepare it and all that. Um, and it has to flow. And it, it's almost like teaching. You know, like you know, you, you never show your conflict or your dis, your debates to the players. All these discussions are had away from the players, so that mm. when you are in front of the players, it's unified, it's purposeful, and 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 explaining it to the players as well, and and asking players for understanding. You know, this is what we're trying to achieve. Do you understand, or have you any questions on it? It's so so important. And um, and again, when you're when you are systematic about how you integrate, you know, the technical, the tactical, and the physical, it buys you time. So there's no problem with my quirk going on a three to four minute spiel about his understanding of the drill because you've bought yourself that time. You're not mm. under pressure. And it, it's like when you're in, in a lecture in college and a student asks a really intriguing good question and you scrap the rest of the great lecture to have that debate. Mm. Players need to understand the why, the how, and the what. And it's also important. So, for example... You know, we're, we're looking at a physiological response within training. So, like, work rest ratio is a very, very important when it comes to the energy systems. So, like, a, a sports scientist or a strength and conditioning coach might look at a particular drill and say, right, this is actually really high intensity. And you don't have heart rate and GPS, but we, we just say this is north of 85% of their maximum heart rate. This is really working on their, their anaerobic energy systems or their glycolic energy system. Now, the thing is, that deteriorates after time. And, and we're doing two minutes in this drill. Where does sports scientists or the strength conditioning coach going in? Maybe instead of doing three, two minutes and the lad's been absolutely knackered and, you know, the quality has gone out mm -hmm. of it after the mm -hmm. second set. Maybe what we could do is four by 90 seconds and just extend the recovery a little bit because that makes physiological sense. That will allow us to maintain that high speed, that high engagement all the way through. But other examples, and you know, I, I don't know if I put her at to show it, but a, a thing I used to do, and it, it used to be one of the fitness sessions um, that I would do. And at times I used to do this with the non-26 players at championship weekends. So I go up to Limerick and, um, or, or Clare or Waterford, or any of the teams I used to do this at all. And I'd meet those non-26 and we would do what would be a fitness session, but it would be technically driven. Mm -hmm. And what I would have is three squares. So let's just say that we had two V2 um, as, the, as the workout, as the stimulus. So two V2 tackling drill, very high intensity and um, glycolic. So we should be looking at a one to three or one to four work rest ratio. Now, there's, there's nowhere in the country that a coach will stay, right, do 30 seconds, now stand there for two minutes and do nothing. It's just not feasible. In sports science, that's the recommendation. That's the textbook. But what we can do is that we can do active recovery. So in the middle box, you might have 2v2 there. In the other box, you might actually just have a long striking drill with a little bit of movement. So the heart rate is way down, yeah. but they're physically active. And then at the other one, it might be a positional drill, where it, like a target drill or something like that. So now you have all these players active. The, the work is in the middle, okay? And that's where I would put a selector or a manager or a coach to say, I'm not the, the skills coach. You're the, you're the experts there. Here's the physical output I'm looking for. And disperse the players over. So we're getting those work to rest ratios. And it goes back to my point about integrating your, your, your fitness. Part. And sorry, Mike. The strength conditioning does athletic performance of sports science. I've always just called myself a fitness trainer. I'm perfectly comfortable yeah. with that. So you take the fitness guy and you use our girl and you use them to integrate everything you can for the whole duration of the session mm -hmm. and, and ask them about work rest ratios and ask them about integrated warm ups and different fun games. And we can avoid a lot of the awful lot of the negative perspectives from a player's perspective. Mm -hmm. Because how many times have you looked at the fitness coach and gone, Oh, geez, don't look at me, don't, don't come over to me, <laughs> like you know. And, and I've had players you make eye contact and they're like. Yeah, you know? yeah, I know. Um, so I, I don't see G, the lack of GPS or heart rate or heart rate variability or, or football technology or any of this stuff as a limiter. Okay, it, I, I see it as a bonus at the elite level. You don't have to have it. Like we, we still use the session RPE, the rate of perceived exertion, on a scale of one to ten and multiply it by the duration. Like I still use that to this day, and you can challenge it all you want, and all the research and science is challenging it. It still can be used, so there's no reason not to quantify load. Um, but we can definitely use common sense. And again, like the very start we spoke, Mike, but identifying the problem. 
So if you team at a club under 16 team and you're noticing they're beginning to flat in the latter stages of the game and they just don't have the endurance, well, instead of having a passing drill in an X, can, can we do a variation of a three-man weave but go to full into the pitch and have a shot at the end of it? And all you're doing is running. That's effectively running, you know, just to build an aerobic base. But they're doing it with the ball. And, you know, like one thing in hurling, and a lot of people disagree with me on this, but again, it's just my opinion. I, I used to never ask the hurdlers to sprint or run without their hurling. And I have coached sprinting and I do have worked for Athletics Ireland. I'm fully appreciative of, of the qualities of good sprinting technique. I'm a massive fan of it. But there's no point in Mike Quirk being a fantastic sprinter but the minute I put a hurley in his hand, he loses all those good qualities. Mm. Because if he throws away the hurley and runs up the field and tackles someone, it's a free life. You know? yeah, yeah, yeah. So again, it's the compromise and it's the common sense. But a pure sprints coach would criticize that and say, no, you can't sprint properly with a hurley. I, I totally agree, you can't. Um, but you have to have your hurley with you when you're a hurler. Yeah, <laughs> you know? yeah, yeah, it's the game, yeah. yeah. Um, Joe, we're, we're nearly there, man. I, I won't keep you on all, all morning, but... Uh, just again, maybe a couple of key messages for people that don't have strength and conditioning coaches with their under 13s or their under 15s. Now, the why you've mentioned several times, which is which is obviously the most pertinent thing that anybody can ask if you're in any coaching capacity. But maybe a couple of uh, of those, like as you say, fitness uh, keys for people working with underage teams to take away. Yeah, uh, particularly with underage teams, that is growth spurts is something that we have to look at. Kids go through different growth spurts, and at times, if you're doing the high volumes at a certain growth spurt or high speed or high power or high strength work at different growth spurts, we should be aware of that. So, and um, there's almost a safety mechanism in it by not going too SNC down that road because by playing the games, we're, we're modifying there as well. Uh, I do think we should in some way, shape or form, quantify load um, uh, for underage teams and, and not just for what they're doing with you, but also what they're doing in PE. Uh, as you said, a young lad's going down there, you know, play, and I've done this with off-season senior players where they might play, I only play a bit of five aside and they play around the golf on a Sunday. And I'm kind of going, well, that's four hours walking around and it's an hour bouncing off fellas as well. Yeah. That's load. Yeah. So with, the, with those kids, and I, I think a lot of your listeners will be with, familiar with the SRPE scale, but I'll just... For those that aren't, mm. so on a scale of one to ten, how hard was the session? So ten is your tongue is out, you can't breathe, you're absolutely max. One is you're sitting down. So, for example, a, a kid might do a, a basketball session as part of PE in school, and they might rate it as a five, uh, and it's, it was only for forty minutes. So that's two hundred units. Now, if if you quantify the two PE sessions for the week, that's four hundred units, and then they might do the football session with their club, uh, and it might be an hour. Um, at, at six or at eight, and say so. That's oh, sure, 420, whatever it is, you know. Yeah, <laughs> I get uh, and I'll multiply by eight. Uh, but it's a very simple way of quantifying the load. And what I often do is, I, at underage, like 15, 16, I, I kind of look at you know, and this is very vague because it varies a lot, but around 2,000 units or two and a half thousand units it is a good load. So if a player or a young athlete is saying that they're tired and you're giving them two five, well, at least you have a number now and say, right, next week. Why don't we try 2-2 two, two and see how you feel? Or if someone is saying, I've loads of energy and I want to do more, maybe they can tolerate a little bit more. But you, you can plan your season all of a sudden. Uh, I'll be honest, that was the primary uh, load monitoring tool with Claire in 2012, 2013. You know, because I used heart rate, but also used SRPE. Uh, and there are faults with it. You know, players would say eight, whatever. So, you, you know... Mike said eight. Well, I'd say eight. Hang on, I want to take Mike's place, so I'm going to say six. No problem. So yeah, there yeah. is an element of education and trust with that, and you have to be a little bit strategic. But you know, being aware of growth spurts, uh, and this goes for all sports. Uh, be aware of the load, and be be aware that you have to quantify the other load as well. You know, and like I a few years back, I, I had a young basketballer that came. His dad came to me and he said, you know, he, he's going to be a really good basketballer, but he needs to get more S and C in. And I was looking at this guy, like he had the height, he had the skills. He, he looked 10 years older than what he was. He looked wrecked. And like what was happening was that he was playing with the school team, he was playing with the club team, but he wouldn't tell the club team what he did at the school in case he'd get in trouble, but he didn't have time. So he'd run home, change his kit uh, and go straight to club training. And he was absolutely wrecked. And his dad was getting tickled with me that I wouldn't give him a strength conditioning program. But we worked out his, his load at over four and a half thousand. And I was like, now add an S&C on top of that. Does he need S&C? Yes. <laughs> yeah. 
but he there's no opportunity. But once you had those numbers, like something had to give. Mm. Um, like I, I don't think I've ever gone over, you know, like three seven, three eight with an intercounty senior team. Mm. Never, mm. you know. And then you have kids doing these massive numbers. But the thing is, if you don't quantify the load, you don't really know what you're doing, and you, you can't just say, "Or should I do an hour on a Tuesday, and a Thursday, and a game on a Sunday?" Because load is very subjective as well. Mm. Like you could have a kid that isn't sleeping well, or you might have someone that's doing grinds after school and their perceived exertion. That's what the RPE is, the rate of perceived exertion. Their perceived exertion is very, very high because they're exhausted from studying. So that doesn't mean, you know, oh no, should everyone's load is the same. You have to look across the whole squad mm. uh, and kids develop at different rates. And then we, like, we have to look at as well the logic of not every household is a good nutritious household that is feeding kids really good quality food. So their, their load is, is different. And then you couple in other sports and other activities. Uh, I'm a fan of having multiple activities and multiple sports, but not overloading our younger kids. Mm. Yeah, I, I like the I like that whole idea about monitoring load. I think that would be a really good thing for for underage coaches to do. You mentioned uh, you mentioned around two thousand units. You're talking there over the course of a week, aren't you? Yeah, over yeah. A week. Just in case people thought they were a, a day or something, but no. uh, and, 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 and how would they? Yeah, go on. Yeah, I was just saying that can undulate as well. So for you know, so, some weeks it can go a little bit higher, some weeks can go a little bit lower. But at least when you have the number, you you can now plan it. Like, Planning everything we should be doing should be, you know, we should plan ahead rather than being reactive. Like, how many times have we seen teams lose by epoxy goal and all of a sudden they're not fit, so they run the legs off? That's reactive, you know. And what we should be looking at doing is is planning and and having a fairly good idea of where we will be and what we want to achieve. Um, and and don't be quantifying things that are totally out of our control. Yeah, no, and I, I, I do think that would really, really help because especially now when things do eventually open up, geez, you're going to see every kind of every sports possible is going to is going to kick off and, and they're going to be saying, come to us, come to us. So you're going to have kids that are going to be, Jesus, they could be going to three or four or five different sports in a week. And, and you know, eventually then you're going to start to see those injuries that you're talking about preventing now by, by doing that work early. And, and one way to do that would be to you know, to, to monitor that load. And it's it's a pretty easy and painless enough task, really, isn't it? Of course it is, yeah, yeah. So, and, and to take most of injuries, and this is a sweeping statement, and a lot of the physiotherapists listening would, you know, they might agree with me, but most injuries, in my opinion, come from too much of a spike in volume. Mm. Like, they mm. just ramp it up yeah. too quickly. And, you know, like, going back in March, April, when I did those articles about coming back too quickly, and, and I, I gave the example of the player who's, you know, worn a, a lap around his back garden and he's running all day and, and then the fellow at home that's you know watching Netflix all day but then when they come back to the club scene well the, the coach will often look at the least fit fella and say right everyone has to do the work until he's fit enough and then one fella's overtrained because he's been training way too much before he yeah. came back and then the other fella's injured because he's done nothing to too much and the spike in load is too much and they end up injured so that's where again just quantified and when you start off with a plan and a process and make your way through it. You need to be right on game day. You mm. don't need to be right in your third session back. Mm. And, you know, that's something I've always said, like, you know, and people kind of go, no, choose. And that's where we often see speed when we get one last session in. And a line I always use is the hay is in the barn. You, know, you, you put the hay in the barn. Every training session is a square bale that goes into the barn. you got to make sure that your barn is full on, on, um, on match day. But don't be trying to put in another trailer load of hay and with one last session, because you're all over, you're all over, overload the barn, and you're going to end up flat, tired, injured, mm-hmm. and mentally and cognitively overloaded, and just miserable. And they're not. That's not a good environment for the no. performance. No, Joe, that's brilliant, man. I, I'm I'm gonna. I think we'll 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 wrap it there. Is there anything, Joe, that, that I haven't got to, that you you think is 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 um that we should have that's worth mentioning mentioning? No, I, I suppose with all the complexity, Mike. For me, my number one coaching tool down through the years and to this day is, is conversation. You know, mm. a cup of tea, like in COVID times, we can't eat for a cup of tea. But I would have allocated at least 10 to 12 hours every week to go meet players. And if we spoke about it or not, you have to make that relationship. And that for me is the ultimate thing. And, and that that's where I think, you know, coaching knowledge and experience comes from. The ability to be able to sit back and, and listen. And, you know, we have two ears and one mouth for a reason that's important. We should listen twice as much as we speak as a coach um, because 
we don't know our players' bodies better than them. Nobody knows your body better than yourself. And, and they'll have nuggets and they, they may not put it in the same language as us, but there's there's clues there. And, and I think we have to listen more than we than we coach sometimes. And that's where the cup of tea comes in. And my grandfather used to always say that two ears, one mouth. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and 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 you know, funny, like everybody, Joe, everybody that I've spoken to now, uh, you know, whether whether it's the fitness side of things or it's the ball side of things, it's the same message. Like it's the same message. Everybody is talking about the need for for better communication between them and and players and and to have those lines of communication really open so people do feel comfortable to to talk about things and about you know even during sessions that we're asking players questions we're 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 seeking understanding as we go we're engaging them in the whole thing and and giving them that sense of sense of ownership and. It's it's uh, I think there's that realization is coming now though that 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 it's a coaching is more of a people business as opposed to the, the whole you know fixation on the X's and O's side of it. Yeah, you, you have to have a sense of empathy and like as I was saying to you before, I, I I think as coaches and it's perfectly understandable we view the scenarios or the problems from a coach's perspective. Mm. I, I think the best coaches are able to view it from a player's perspective as well, have a level of understanding from a player's perspective. And then when you can see it from both sides, you have an open dialogue, then, you know, rather than telling players, you're, you're talking with players. Uh, and, and you know, I, I often give the example that you, you can see a match from the sideline, you can see it like in the rugby from high up, and you can see it from behind goals. We've all these different angles, but how, could you imagine if we had a player cam on a player's chest and see it from their perspective? Mm. And sometimes we advise and we direct without actually working hard and seeing it from their perspective, but also to try to understand it from their understanding. You know, um, like I'm in my 40s now, so when, when I'm working with a guy 19, 20 that's coming in and he's getting his break in an inter-county team, you know, like what I try to do is go, what's going through his head like, mm. you know? He's walking down the street, he's known, you know, and six months ago he was in school, no one knew him, you know, all this kind of stuff. And like uh, one very practical example, and, and he managed it so well was Shane O'Donnell in 2013. Like, yeah, and uh, Shane, Shane came on in the replay and banged in three goals, and all of a sudden he went to this. And uh, but like that guy is operating on a different level when it comes to intelligence, anyway. But yeah. my point being is that's very taxing. Do we really need to be adding more cognitive load and mental tax on these players with stuff that isn't the most important thing, you know? And that's that context and compromise. I work so, so hard at trying to identify the context so I know what I can compromise on. And I throw out good stuff all the time. It's just not, you know, I try to keep the best stuff or the stuff that fits best into the system mm. with my colleagues in the backroom team. And we and, and that goes across the whole everyone like in the backroom team, regardless of the sport. You know, like the team I'm working with, our sport Ireland at the moment, like we so excellent professionals working together and, and my God, we're all bouncing off each other. It's fantastic, like you know. Yeah. Uh, and we have to do that. The one thing you leave at the door as a coach is your ego. You yeah. know, leave yeah. that at the door. <laughs> it, it was it was creeping I, I, in. I, I think it's it might be social media and stuff. There's there's a lot of egos in the sports science strength and conditioning stuff. So, uh, it amazes me, like because I'm kind of going right. Maybe when you when you finish college, you might get a coach a team. You might have a different viewpoint to what you're doing right now. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Social media is is uh, I don't know, man. I I I I see this the 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 amount of self promotion, Joe, and and uh, it's a much bigger you know point maybe than we're talking about here. But it's just it's 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 dangerous in one sense because people it, find it hard to separate quality from 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 the rest of the stuff, you know. And you know I I'm I'm working with a guy above that I I think is just like top top guy that I've I've ever come across. He was inside with rugby and he's just a brilliant guy, and you know speaks along the exact same lines that you're talking, Joe. And uh, the guy doesn't do social media. He's not you know it's not it's not but other people who I know are not anywhere near that kind of quality, are, are promoting themselves in a way that, you know, other people just can't distinguish between the quality and, and, uh, and the chat, yeah. I suppose. You the, the Dunning-Kruger effect, uh, have you heard of that one before? No. Where, um, versus I call them, they're at every course, they've got every certificate going, but they've actually never got their hands dirty and actually worked with players or athletes and so on. So for me, being certified is fantastic and it's great, you need it for your insurance, but the real nuggets come from getting down and making mistakes in the industry. And that will give you a combination of experience and knowledge. But what, what, what Dunning-Kruger presented was that when you have a little bit of information and 
one of these social media guys might have read an article or a book or something, which is great. Uh, and their confidence is through the roof and they're so adamant they're right. And it's almost like they're trying to create a cult following, you know, but as the longer we're in industry and the more we study this coaching philosophy, coaching science, the more we kind of say there's a lot more to this. And sometimes people get criticized for saying it depends. And I say it depends all the time because <laughs> I'm well and truly in that valley of despair. Like, yeah. And the more I study, the more I talk to coaches like yourself, the more papers I read, the more, you know, people I follow that read their books, their autobiographies, you're kind of going, oh my God, this is such a complex thing. And it really depends. And, and that's why I, I know I sound like a broken record and it's an easy out for me to say context and compromise. Mm. But from my experience, I have to work so, so hard to get the context of where the player is coming from or what we're trying to achieve so that I can know what to compromise on. But that comes from experience. Mm. Like I started out as a fitness instructor in 1998 so I'm, I'm around the while and I think an awful lot of these social media really driven strength coaches, fitness coaches that haven't done a whole pile in the trenches would get an awful lot of benefit if they went to work in their local leisure centre and had to train 40, 50 clients from all different things because it would develop their skill set to be a human with a sense of empathy and to look at the problem and match the solution to the problem. Mm. Broad, like confirmation bias is a massive thing online where they have their certain beliefs and they throw their beliefs at every problem mm. under the assumption that their beliefs will fix everything. Uh, and that's what Dunning-Kruger presented. So as you get become more of an expert, you start climbing that slope of enlightenment. And uh, geez, do I hate that word guru? You know, anyone who calls themselves a guru, let's say, I'll just stop from reflecting. <laughs> um, but that slope of enlightenment, uh, maybe when I'm, you know, 40, 45 years in the industry, I might start climbing that slope of enlightenment. But you know, uh, and I uh, the HPX conference, the nutrition conference last year, and uh, led by Sharon Madigan and Sport Ireland, and and this is we addressed this like, the exact topic in relation to nutrition, and sure, anyone that eats an avocado knows nutrition. <laughs> uh, for me, if you know, there are like I have a master's in nutrition, but I would I wouldn't be cocky enough to call myself a nutritionist. You know. Uh, I, I, I lecture in performance nutrition and I'm very much stay within my lane and my scope of practice. I think we need to engage a hell of a lot more with dietitians uh, when it comes to nutrition because they're the people who are qualified to do that. But yeah, that, that's the Dunning-Kruger effect. And mm. I think when you sit back and look at it, you could probably classify some people that live on top of Mount, Mount Stupid. I like, I, like, I like the Mount Stupid idea, Joe. Yeah, I've come across a lot of those people, man. Yeah, it is. Like you mentioned empathy there a couple of times, Joe. And like, I know uh, a very a very well-known hurling coach around the place who, who was telling me about, you know, how he took up golf as, a, as an adult, um, like almost with the, the, the intention of, of finding out what it was like to, to learn how to you know do something completely new out of his comfort zone like a child picking up a hurley or a football or a basketball or a rugby ball for the first time and and we're looking at them trying to throw or trying to catch or trying to hit and saying jesus like what, what's the problem here and and suddenly when you stand on a tee box with three other people watching you holding a driver that you're not really sure about where this ball is going to go or even if you're going to hit the ball it brings you back to that that eight-year-old or that six-year-old when there's adults kind of talking and shouting and other kids and i don't feel really confident in myself uh, and there's nothing like that'll that'll give you that sense of empathy more than more than learning a new skill or starting yeah. and being a learner at something from for the first day again you know there was, a, there was an interesting paper published there uh, just in January in, in the equine science. So it, it looked at the difference of the heart rate and the cortisol levels, the stress hormone levels of the horse and the rider mm. in replicated competition and in actual competition. So with crowds and without crowds. Mm. And the horse's cortisol and heart rate were like with like. It didn't matter. Right. But when the crowds were there, for it was the rider's heart rates were elevated by 10 to 15% just with the presence of the crowds. Mm which totally feeds into what you're saying there, that there's an awful lot of noise. Mm. And sometimes we, we don't appreciate that the noise that comes in and the clarity. Like I, I remember I had a very good soccer coach back in Raquel, Sean Hartnett. And like, I was no way a good soccer player. I played a, a bit and stuff. But mm. I, I remember one time I, as a player, and it, it sticks in me so clear, like, you know, because I've, I've had so many great coaches that helped me form how I coach. But I, I used to remember when I used to get possession of the ball, that it felt like everything closed in on top of me and I put my head down and like, there's no one within 10 yards of you, Joe. What are you putting your head down for? Yeah. And he pulled me aside and he was saying, just imagine that you have this shield around you so that when you touch the ball, the shield was going, boom. And it just gave me a visual straight away. So it got my head up 
And, you know, I was playing right back, right wing. And all of a sudden, that 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 one thing he said, it stuck with me. Like, I, I must have been, I don't know what age. I was very young, but it stuck with me. And I can still feel the tightness coming in where everything came in on top of me. Now, I had no problem with my touch because when I was kicking the ball off the wall at home, I could touch, I could trap the ball. It was no mm. problem. Mm. But once that coach said that to me, it quietened the noise and I was able to get my head up. Mm. And, you know, at my level, then it was like, give it to the good guy. <laughs> You know? yeah, 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 yeah. But uh, I, I think it's very interesting that and, and sense of empathy is so so important. And and the best coaches and the best managers have it in abundance. And mm. and they're they're perfectly comfortable with being quiet, you know. And sometimes, and and I'm sure you get it. Like we do interviews the whole time. People are they listening to you? Or are they waiting for you to stop talking yeah. before they say something else? Yeah. And and I, I think that ability to listen is so so critical. And another thing I've always found that it has helped me. It's, it's okay to show vulnerability or just, it's okay to say, I don't really know, to be honest, what do you think? You know, and, and I, I think that comes the more, the longer I've been coaching in whether it be athletics or, you know, I, I, I do other sports as well where I help people out. Uh, you know, I think it, it, it brings you on side. Then you say, right, I, I have my skill set, you have your skill set. We don't have the answer yet, but I think together we'll get there. Mm-hmm. Rather than always having the persona to say, well, yeah, I'm the guru. Uh, I have 100,000 followers, of which 95 I paid for. Um, <laughs> you know, and therefore I have all the answers. And we don't have all the answers. You know, if we did, we'd, we'd, we'd be sorted. And yeah. that's the beauty of what we do as coaches. It's, that's what I love about being a fitness coach, is that you're always presented with, uh, with different challenges. And you're on a journey with that person. And, and you have to know when to get off that journey. You know, I've worked with players and athletes in different sports where I go, no, you're, you're, you're going beyond my capabilities and here's someone you need to, to talk to. And, and, and particularly in the nutrition side of things, because my master's is in nutrition and, and that. But when it comes to the point that it goes outside my scope of practice, I have a, a list of dietitians that I'll go, right, you're, you're one out of my realm pass it on. And mm. it, it pays you back in spades, I think. Mm. Yeah, and it's... That collaborative idea, I suppose, really, Joe. Again, like that, it's 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 not you're not the fountain of knowledge. Whether you're the whether you're, you're the actual skills coach or the manager or the fitness coach, it's just that whole collaboration of 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 getting the most, as well as the players, obviously, and and making sure that we're valuing what they're saying and what they want to do and how they see it. You know that that's the collaboration that that works best, really. You know, um, and the players have to be front and center, don't they? Mm, yeah, you know, it's it they have to be. And, you know, sometimes uh, we, we don't treat players like humans. Like I've mm. seen that happen. You, you have to, because they're the ones at the end of the day. And I, I often wonder, Mike, and I'll ask you straight out, here's me, well, I'm changing roles. And when you're on the pitch, c- can you hear managers and, and coaches? And uh, like, if there's a ball coming down, don't drop it. I was planning on thinking about catching it, to be honest. <laughs> I didn't think about not dropping it. <laughs> you yeah, know? yeah. No. And, you know, I, I, I you know, I, great admiration for John Kiley like that if you watch him on the sideline that's what he does so so well like he's calm he's composed and and you know the likes of Brian Cole of course there's periods of time where you get involved yeah and it's um yeah it's it's difficult man and and especially during COVID it's obviously like playing the games behind closed doors it was very different because you were more audible and 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 it, yeah. and you know there's a lot of guys so those kind of I mentioned before those kind of PlayStation coaches you know and it uh, and again, I, I I always refer back to the to the kids, like you know, the, the coaches that are that are there and they're trying to control. They're pressing their X button and they're moving up the field. They're tell catch, catch, do whatever. And they're trying to actually orchestrate them. Whereas, you know, just leave, leave them play. You know, stay quiet. You've done your stuff on a on a Tuesday, and a Thursday, or Tuesday, Friday, whatever it is. And now let's let's the kids try and figure it out and ask them questions and see how we can go and. Uh, it's just the nature of it. We all want to we want to be the ones that are controlling it and driving it on, but. Yeah. Ultimately, that's probably not the best approach to, to, to take for the whole well, thing, you know. And, and if you think, if you look at some of the most successful coaches down through the years, like you know, whether it be in basketball, like the Red Bulls, and we, we saw it, like they, they were communicators with a sense of empathy, and they realized that they have exceptional, talented people in, at their disposal, and you're not leading them. Like in fact, they, I believe the players are leading you; they're allowing you in on their journey. Mm-hmm. And you, you have to have that mentality, like, you know, every minute, every team that I've worked with, I've, I've been honoured just to be able to work with such talented people and, and, and I work with them. And for more times than that, I, I work for them. 
Mm. Uh, and that's the mentality like, you know, I, I, I don't think I've now obviously some players are going to listen to this and say no you, you definitely told me to do something <laughs> but I, I, I've always felt that I, I, I tried to have the conversation and yeah. tried to express understanding mm. you know so someone doesn't like the bench press I go alright right why all right, maybe we'll look at a dumbbell press uh, it, it's a different set of benefits but you know tell, let's, let's discuss it yeah yeah. And, some, and, and some players down through the years just have not been into fitness, mm. strength and conditioning. Like it is not there. They don't have a grow up. Mm. And other players really do. And, and that takes a different skill set as well. So you're coming in with all your, your, your experience, your qualifications. You know what works. And you know if this player does X, Y, Z, they will get X, Y, Z result. But they don't have the burning drive inside to do it. So you have to approach it from a point that you're going, right, where can I meet this guy halfway? And where can I make him better? by having him on side as opposed to forcing him making better mm. and having him go in the opposite direction. Because mm. that's the guy that would be going off then and having the Chinese and the potatoes and the coke. And did you do your mobility? I did join that. Great job. And then you do a mobility test and you send this fellow hasn't stretched in about six weeks. <laughs> you know? yeah, yeah. So you, you can't force it on him. And, and that's where the, and, and that's what I feel in our colleges and in our course, court, uh, coach education courses, we should put more emphasis on, the, the soft skills and the human skills oh, yeah. and, and, and teach because it's it's not everyone has it naturally. You have to work hard at it. You know, it took me a lot of years to show a vulnerability to my personality to be able to communicate with players because mm. I, I, I suppose I didn't have the confidence to do it. But I think if you're confident in yourself and confident in your ability, you're perfectly comfortable with saying, I don't know, or saying, this is what I think, what do you think? Um, but that, I don't think you can get that from a book or from a podcast or from anything. I think you have to get that by putting yourself out there and, you know, getting feedback from players because the feedback you get from players is priceless. The conversations and stuff players have said to me down through the years, it's, it's stuck in my head mm. and I, I, I learned from it. And, and it varies an awful lot. You know, I, I remember going back um, years ago I, and I was young, younger, <laughs> um, but it was 2010 and, and Tony Brown, like for me, who was one of the most inspiring players I've ever worked with. But we're, we were on our way to a match, once a championship match, and he had the helmet on in the bus. And me being the fool that I was, I mean, why are you wearing the helmet for? Like, not knowing what I know now that he was, he'd come from an era where you didn't wear a helmet. Mm. He was doing everything in his power to get used to wearing the helmet. And, and like, do you know, he, he looked at me and I'm just trying to get in the zone. If it was me now, I would know to leave Tony alone, you yeah. know, and uh, Tony's such a nice guy, he'd have never said it to me, but I could see it in his eyes. Like, and it just goes to show that they're the things, you know, mm. where you sit in the bus. Are, are you the person that sits at the front and never goes back to the players and make sure they're okay for a bottle of water or a bit of fruit? Those things make a big difference. And, you know, a, a guy might be having you know, something different to what you're recommending. And you're saying, why, not why you don't that. One, right, maybe I didn't make myself clear on what I was trying to achieve. Can you explain to me why you need to do something? And those little things. But then, and I know I'm ranting on now, Mike. Oh, go ahead, another, man. Yeah, it's good. Another, another thing that I've always found is to maintain the coach-player relationship, you know? There's loads of fellas I would love to be their friend. And, mm. you know, when we go away on holidays and that, I, I could let my guard down and be there, you know, go for a few pints and have yeah. the crack. And, but I, I think you have to keep that relationship mm. professional. So I, when I'm working with a team, I'm not there to be their friends. I'm not there... To, you know to that's a different relationship yeah. um and you have to keep that professional mind now that doesn't mean you have to be a complete nutter i nearly said it dry leo yeah. <laughs> you, know? oh, yeah, yeah. you don't have to be one of them because that would break down your coaching strength as well because they'll say this fellow's just a, a machine he doesn't communicate but you do have to keep that professional line um and you know there's times like we were over in, in, in Boston and I remember going, I didn't want to do at more than go and have the crack with the lens. But uh, at the time we stood against it. I was like, no, I need to keep my distance here. So I went up to the room on my own. I just felt no. But when uh, everything was done that we had to be done, we had great crack. And I felt yeah. more comfortable being myself with the lens then. But you have to keep that professional line. Yeah. Up. Yeah. Interesting. You, 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 and it's a, it's a term that's been used a lot now. And it's something I really, I, I dislike because I think it, 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 it dissuades coaches from going in this direction. But you mentioned soft skills there in terms of, of, of uh, what, I, what I call just people skills, like, you know, the talking, yeah. but it, this, that's the language now that, that, that's out there, you know, this idea of soft skills. And I think when people hear that, it's like soft, like it's not really something that I, I you know, I'm a man, I'm a coach, I, I'm the boss. 
and I, I think it's something, it's language like that that maybe people are kind of going, no, no, I'm into, I'm, I'm into driving them. I want to, I want to, I want to win. I want them to be winners. I want to drive on. Like I, I think a lot of the coaching courses, Joe, and I know we're we're rambling mad here, but the, a lot yeah. of the coaching courses at the moment, like there needs to be a big shift. I think away from, not away from, but you need to add in that idea of these people skills, like because, yeah. because, like how many coaches. Like, like you mentioned, your soccer coach from way back when you were what, what was that underage, under under? I, I must have been in under twelve, I'd say. Under twelve, so we're yeah, talking. I, I, I can't remember exactly. Yeah. like you know, yeah. You're in the bones of thirty years ago, though, you know, and you yeah, can still yeah. remember like that. This person gave you a, a, a lesson or or a, or a help that actually you know did something, and and ultimately these are the people then that are fostering that lifelong love of sport and physical activity in people and. And I, I just think if we can if we can get coaches, particularly at underage, to stop worrying about, you know, the exact technical points of each and every skill and, and of each of every run or whatever it is, and start being good people, have have those people skills to to really get people to fall in love with the game, to fall in love with being active, to being outside, being healthy. They're the people we want because there's very few people that are going to go on and play intercounty or they're going to be international athletes or they're going to be whatever. So the vast majority of people, we just want them to be active and to be healthy and love the game and get back involved with your club in a coaching capacity or a or a administration capacity when you finish playing. And and I think college courses like coaching, like all these coaching Ireland courses for the different organisations, they need to start pushing that narrative a little bit more. I feel that. It's it's more than the X's and O's. It's about the people, and and how we do that is really really important. A hundred percent, Mike. And you know, simple things like and I, I see this with younger people at the moment. One of the softest skills that I really value is eye contact. You mm. know, look at these people in the eye, and mm. you can look someone in the eye and say a thousand things without opening your mouth once. Like you know, yeah. uh, and we're we're in a society with a lot of the players and athletes. We're doing they spend most of their day with this thing. Yeah. Them, you know, uh, and they'll text you about it and talk to you. So. I think there is an onus on coaches to almost draw these younger people out of the, the social media, phone addiction, screen time things. And, and that's hard because it's hard for the younger people as well, because that's like I look at some of our first year students coming in now and we, we tend to forget that they spent their first year in college screen time. I remember first year, like, like we were in college at the same time in Chile. Yeah. Uh, my experience is probably different to what the first year's experience is now. But the thing we forget they did their leaving cert that way as well. Yeah. So they've, they've had a very long period yeah. of time without proper human interaction, no. And that is so, so important. And, you know, like I've had scenarios where I've looked into a player's eyes and I think this sounds a bit ridiculous. And I've said nothing to that player, but I, I, I might have gone to the, to the psychologist or the manager and I was going, like, I have no idea what's wrong. But I can just tell there's mm. something not right there. You know, maybe you know something I don't know, but I, I just, you know, it might be someone that might be feeling a little bit down or the hoodie might be up, they might be slightly, you know. Yeah. And they're the skills that, and I totally agree with you. The problem is, the reason you can't coach it is that there's no manual for that. Mm-hmm. And there's no, there's no script, <laughs> you know. There's no right way of doing it. And I, I think sometimes we, we coach and we t- train and we teach to do the right thing. And it mm-hmm. goes back to my very original point. Maybe the right thing in this scenario is actually the wrong thing in another scenario. Mm -hmm. So you can't just throw that right thing at everything. Mm -hmm. So you have to be developed the skill set to read the situation and read what's right in front of you. Um, And for that, you want to make mistakes and you have to be comfortable with making mistakes. But you have to have the confidence and the strength to read the situation. And then, as I have done so many times down through the years, lean on my colleagues, lean on the players themselves, lean on other people for help. Because... There's no way I'd be arrogant enough to think I can start that. No way. But maybe yeah. I could have identified it, but I'm, that doesn't mean I'm the person that can fix it. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I totally agree. Um, you know, some of the best coaches, and particularly in athletics, like I've, I've had brilliant coaches, like one of my original coaches, Breed O'Sullivan, above in the Castle West. I, when I study coaching science and I read the autobiographies of some of the best coaches in the world, she'd me running, and, and all my colleagues from Cooley Roo and Raquel and West Limerick and um, you know just Liam Rail and would have run for Limerick would have trained with us and Pat McCartan a lot of these guys Jergana they're all good club runners or elite runners some of the stuff she would have done with us when we were younger coaching it's now being published and it's now being held up as the, the things like the communication skills and you know the redirecting coaching capacities and all that she doing that years ago mm-hmm. and never never took a dime for it did it all for free and had significant influence 
Mm. Like, I, I'm not going to start listening to people with influence on me and my yeah. profession for my career. But I think sometimes younger coaches don't realize yeah. that one comment or one action yeah. can lead to a long term positive effect or a long term scarring mm. effect. And therefore, we have to be humans who work with humans rather than coaches who work with athletes. Yeah, brilliant. Joe, I think that's a good way to wrap it up. I, I, I think if, if coaches take nothing more than the simple that works is better than the complicated that doesn't. Did I get that right? 100%, yeah. Joe, I want to thank you very much, man. I thought that was, that was brilliant. I, I, we went rambling, but I think that was the rambling was as good as the rest of it. So um, I want to thank you a million, man, for your, for your time. And, and again, obviously, just for the people that are listening, uh, as I would have said in the introduction, I, I'm doing these, I suppose, Joe, for, for two reasons. The first one was to try and provide a bit of debate for coaches at a time when we can't be on the field or, or, or in the gym with our players. And, and then secondly, and probably most importantly, was as a, as a fundraiser for Temple Street Children's Hospital. So um, there's a link. There'll be a link there in the podcast description below uh, or on my Twitter page. And uh, again, if you have donated, thank you very much. And thanks to all the people who, who continue to share it around the place. Uh, it's, it's going to a very, very worthy cause. So yeah. thanks again, Joe. Much appreciated. No worries, Mike. I'll just finish on saying for all those people we offended on social media, put your hand in your pocket. <laughs> put your hand in your pocket and give some money to Temple Street. Yeah, the, that, that, we'll, all is forgiven if you do that. <laughs> the, the people on Mount Stupid. Yeah, oh, Jesus. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You can Great. buy your way off Mount Stupid by giving 50 euros <laughs> to Temple Street. All right? That's a fact. <laughs> Thanks, Joe. Thanks, Mike.